Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues around the globe, warmly welcome you uh, to today's webinar, seminar um, discussion. I hope very much we will have an interactive discussion on a topic that is very dear to all of us. The title, the state of protection in the core COVID-19 area is, is, is a broad and a heavy title, but it's a title that is very opportune and and, and I think hits the, the, the nail at its head. Today is a special evening. A, we have the Global Protection Forum that comes to an end, that was organized by the Global Protection Cluster and by the NRC, the Norwegian Refugee Council, which emphasized the crucial role of protection as a life-saving activity. That's the first one. Secondly, we have the launch of the NRC report. I hope very much all of you, you have seen the report, you could um, go through it, particularly its recommendation, its findings. Um, so this is the second uh, event. And thirdly, indeed, we are on, on the eve of tomorrow's launch of the global humanitarian overview, the sort of the state of the union of humanitarian aid. It's an opportune and an important um, moment to, to get together and I welcome you all around the globe, I heard people that where it's one o'clock in the morning, uh, other people who just got up here in Geneva, we have uh, six o'clock at night. It's very much appreciated that you make the effort to be with us and Switzerland is, is, is happy to co-host together with uh, Norwegian Refugee Council and the Global Protection Cluster uh, this event. Protection, um, Excellencies, colleagues, has to be at the core of humanitarian aid. People, civilians, those not or not anymore taking part of hostilities have to be, have to feel safe in their physical integrity, in their uh, minds, and um, in their dignity. Yes, of course, states, first of all, have the responsibility for protecting people on their territory. When you claim sovereignty, you have, you have obligations. And this is indeed also the protection of, of uh, the people on your territory. But in contexts where states are not uh, willing or unable to protect the civilians on their territory, there it is an obligation. It's a duty to step in for us, for the humanitarian uh, community, for the international community, for actors, for donors, for advocates to protect civilians from harms. That's why I say protection has to be at the core. Dignity and security for civilians um, and persons who do not or no longer take part in hostilities or are exposed to other forms of violence or threats are the basis of meaningful humanitarian assistance. Independent before COVID-19, humanitarian needs of the most vulnerable exploded uh, in, in recent years. More than 168 million women, men, girls, boys need humanitarian assistance, out of which about 60 percent, that's about uh, 96 million, that's the population of Egypt. These people are in need of protection as a consequence of armed conflict or other situation of uh, violence, also natural disasters. Conflict and natural disasters have also led to an uh, alarming number of force, uh, forcible displacement. By the end of last year, we had nearly 80 million people displaced. And these displaced people are, of course, in particular need of protection. 50 million about of, out of these uh, 80 millions were internally within uh, the border of their state displaced. That's 10 times the population of, of, of Switzerland. Um, we see at the same time with these alarming figures, um, a declining compliance with international humanitarian law and with human rights law. Some examples, take the Central African Republic where 60%, about 2 million people are considered to be in need of protection. They are uh, exposed to killings, to death threats, to conflict-related uh, sexual um, related violence, rape, cruelty, inhuman treatment, arbitrary uh, depreciation of liberty, uh, recruitment of children, you name it. All these phenomena um, uh, threaten 
half of the population of a whole country. We have in recent uh, days the northern region in Ethiopia, the Tigray region, where over this weekend, uh, allegedly the regional capital, Mekele, uh, was liberated, uh, fell to um, uh, an, an attack where over half a million civilians were um, located in this uh, regional arm. We have the Rakhine refugee crisis. We have Afghanistan. We have uh, the killings in Nigeria, where we heard in northern Borno state a region close to uh, Maiduguri, um, over 50 uh, farmers were killed arbitrarily. We have um, protection needs all over um, the world. In this regard, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to highlight on three aspects for the coming panel discussions. First, the effect of the global health pandemic on protection. I think this is for sure worthwhile to look how the pandemic influenced, increased, amplified um, the, the, the protection needs. Secondly, the centrality, as I mentioned, the, 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 the key of humanitarian um, uh, aid, the centrality of protection, I would like to uh, look at, and I would very much appreciate your views on it and your recommendations and your um, call uh, in this regard. Thirdly, the financing. The report of NRC um, emphasizes very much the financing of protection. For sure, it's an important issue uh, that we have to look at. It would be great in the coming panel discussion to have these uh, three points particularly uh, emphasized. The global health pandemic has been both a magnifying glass for highlighting um, uh, protection challenges and at the same time, a dramatic amplifier for existing threats and vulnerabilities. Lockdown and confinement uh, measures hit everybody. We were all affected. We have the, the pandemic here in Switzerland, but we were very differently uh, affected and felt uh, the pandemic in a very different way. Vulnerable people uh, who often uh, work in the informal sector and with no social and, 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 and protection or, or any sort of security have been mostly affected by the lockdown measures taken by the government. And coupled with increased food prices, they immediately fell into food insecurity. Millions of labor migrants, if they were not stranded, they um, uh, returned home to their families, which led the families into poverty if, because the remittance uh, didn't uh, flow anymore. The pandemic has created tension and fears, uh, which led to stigmatization um, of the most vulnerable groups of spreading the virus. Such fears and misinformation result in tension and violence against marginalized uh, groups, such as migrants, as well as, as refugees. The closure of borders has prevented the people who fled from um, violence from seeking asylum. During the COVID gender-based violence, GBV uh, became a shadow uh, pandemic with dramatic rise in cases of um, sexual and gender-based violence. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, emerging data and reports have shown uh, that all types of violence, particularly against women and girls, particularly domestic violence and violence by partners in the same household has anti uh, intensified. We have reports from um, Eastern Africa. We have reports from the Middle East. We have also reports in Switzerland where we have an increase of, of domestic violence um, since the pandemic hit. More than 10% of the cases in Switzerland uh, went up. The closure of schools affected more than 1.3 billion students, uh, pupils and students um, to go to school in more than 130 uh, countries. 1.3 billion of kids, that's a population of India that do not go to school. Some of them since um, the beginning of, of this year. The education system, um, but already before in a lot of country faced difficulties uh, sort of collapsed uh, with the additional burden um, of the pandemic. Refugee and migrant, uh, migrant children, children with disability, girls, street kids, they were exposed to great risks um, of not being able anymore to go to schools. Despite the call of a global ceasefire by uh, the United Nations Secretary General, the pandemic did not turn out to be a catalyst for peace. 
On the contrary, actually, in the first months of the pandemic, some of non-state actors, such as ISIS in Afghanistan, the Sahel in Iraq, increased their violence and uh, exposed uh, civilians to more um, vulnerabilities. At the same time, humanitarian access got increasingly restricted, be it because of security threats, because of bureaucratic and political impediments, or uh, because of, 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 of targeted attacks against humanitarians. Furthermore, access was also hampered by the travel restrictions. I have to admit, I, this year I was only three times in the field. Uh, I sort of have the feeling I lose the contact with the field, partly because of these travel restrictions, make it much more difficult to know what's going on, to uh, adjust our activities and to be updated of, um, uh, of the needs in, in the field. This issue of limited access to uh, most of vulnerable um, population strongly hamper protection. So not only because we cannot get access easily, these population uh, to provide services, but also access, also protection is sort of uh, in danger because we do not dare to speak out against humanitarian uh, their violations of uh, humanitarian, uh, international humanitarian law or human rights law because of the fear that we lose access. So it's a constant balance act between fighting for the right of the population we serve, denouncing violations and ensuring humanitarian access. How do we find here the right balance? What is more useful for the protection of civilians, an outspoken advocate who, lose, who lost access because he or she spoke out, or a humanitarian actor who works in complete confidentiality and does not go public? But thanks to this, um, this question, he, she can maintain access. To address this dilemma, we need to have foremost the interest of the population in mind, the population we have, want to serve. And this uh, is for sure an issue I would be of great interest to address in the in the coming uh, panel discussions. All these points that I uh, raised um, showed the, that the health that the health pandemic turned into a global protection crisis, and emphasized the call that I made in the very beginning for the centrality of uh, protection, which is so key. The better the need and the rights of the population that we want to serve are understood, addressed and protected, the better the health crisis can be uh, dealt um, with. Therefore, we need to join forces. We need, of course, to um, spread and uh, respect, uh, spread the respect of IHL. We need to uh, spread the awareness of the importance and uh, of uh, the centrality of uh, protection, and we um, have to work on the access uh, question that is for us so key to have an effective um, impact with our humanitarian assistance. Only if we join forces, um, this centrality of protection can be implemented. In this regard, I call all on you, on you all, to um, um, come together and to drive this discussion forward, particularly an innovative, um, the innovative uh, approach that we need. In this regard, dear colleagues, um, my second point, perhaps quickly, the need for smart uh, financing. More needs to be done in terms of financing. Yes, we need more money uh, if, uh, for uh, protection, but we need also a better tracking of the money. We need also a, a smarter use of the money. And um, we need also a good understanding of the needs in terms of financing when it comes to protection. Last year, um, the number of people in need of humanitarian assistance, as I said, raised to over 400 um, um, uh, million. And the requirements to address these needs were 40 billion US dollars. The new report of NRC showed that increasing gap between the needs and the funds um, is, is, is increasing. And we are in desperate need of uh, mobilizing and raising these funds. Therefore, we need not only more, but we need sustainable 
funding for also the protection. We need smart financing. Furthermore, reducing protection risk requires also intervention that change behavior and address the underlying causes of violence over several years. It's not a one-off little bit of protection and then it's dealt with. But by uh, protection funding has to be sustainable over a long period of time. That means also smart funding has to include the full range, the full synergy of uh, the nexus. It has to include humanitarian, but also development and peace act uh, actor funding. So we have to broaden the funding um, uh, possibilities and we have to um, explain that protection is actually an ongoing um, activity that needs to be taken by, um, by a broad uh, a community and not only as a humanitarian uh, challenge. I would like to conclude um, this uh, introduction, which I hope gave some sparks to the, the, to the, um, to the panel to address of these points by thanking really all the participants around the world, particularly um, NRC, particularly the Global Protection Cluster for bringing us together, for um, coming up with this new report. And I look very much forward uh, to an interesting interaction discussion. Of course, I hope also a discussion that brings us forward because very often we sort of uh, preach to the converted. What we have to do is to think outside the box, as we always say, to go a step forward, to dare, but always having in mind the interest of people, of the people we serve. In this regard, I would like to give to our moderator, to Chris uh, Gun uh, Gunnis, for um, bringing us or guiding us through the discussion. Chris, over to you. Thank you so much, Manuel. Uh, to be clear, our aim is to galvanize donors, energize protection partners, and put the spotlight on neglected populations on the eve of the launch of the Global Humanitarian Overview, which is the world's most comprehensive evidence-based survey of the current state and future trends in humanitarian action. One thing is now certain, the gap between protection needs in these times of the pandemic and protection funding is growing alarmingly to unprecedented levels. Thanks to a new report we're unveiling today by the Norwegian Refugee Council and the Global Protection Cluster, we now have empirical evidence, data to show exactly that. And it's data that should focus the minds of the headline writers. One, first headline, in 2020, funding so far this year for protecting the most vulnerable on our planet is receiving just 25% of what is required. Nearly 32 million people earmarked for protection in 2019 did not receive any assistance at all. And a headline that gives a revealing snapshot of the donor community, 68% of the protection sector, the funding for the protection sector comes from just five donors. Well, to discuss the findings of the new report, but also to draw together the latest conclusions of the Global Protection Forum, which has been meeting over the last four months, we have a distinguished panel of experts. Manuel and I are joined by Jan Egeland, Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council, Mayarlin Vergara Perez, Regional Coordinator of the Fundacion Renancer, who's also a Nansen Refugee Award winner, Gillian Triggs, Assistant High Commissioner for Protection at UNHCR, Cecilia Jimenez Damare, UN Special Rapporteur for the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons, and William Chemerley, Coordinator of the Global Protection Cluster. Welcome to all our panelists. And before I come to them, allow me to explain the format. I will chat to each panelist for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open up to interventions and questions from the floor. Jan Egeland, I'd like to start with you. Um, the NRC Protection Cluster Report, what for you are the most shocking aspects, the most shocking findings of this report? Jan. Well, Chris, uh, the most shocking thing is, uh, is really that tens of millions of the most vulnerable on this planet are under attack from men with guns and power and they are alone, where they're not protected. They are being attacked today, they will be attacked tomorrow. They are women abused, 
sexually with sexual violence, children forcefully recruited, all of the things that uh, Manuel Bescher uh, uh, just mentioned. And we're in 2020 and we're not there in their hour of greatest need. Jan, I'm going to come on to those specific situations, that hour of need that you refer to, but let's talk about money, which is essentially what this new report is about. Yep. It shows the funding gap, very empirically shown, but you know, I'm speaking to you from London where the government is struggling, let's be frank, to meet the needs of protecting its own citizens. What do you say to that argument that frankly, the donor community is also itself strapped for cash? Uh, of course, there is a there is a global economic crisis. All economies are are affected. But when we document in our report that protection needs, which would should be the most basic to do something about, that they are particularly underfunded, we should also remember that the fifty greatest economy on the planet have just given themselves more than 10 trillion. I'm not talking about billions now. I'm talking about trillions of dollars. So uh, when we're not getting the 2 billion that is needed for the protection uh, projects that we identified through our protection cluster, it's 0, 0.0. 2% really, it's a fraction. This is what we can afford even in the time of a pandemic. Now, Jan, sorry to interrupt you. You touched on this in your first answer. Tell me a bit about the new situations. You've got 15,000 NRC workers around the world dealing with the new realities of the COVID era. We keep hearing this word unprecedented. What are these unprecedented challenges on the ground that your staff are having to deal with because of COVID? Well, what we need to uh, realize is that during this pandemic, none of the previous conflicts and problems went away. There was new conflict in, in Tigray, a new conflict in northern Mozambique and elsewhere, many more also natural disasters. And then on top of that, a devastating pandemic that meant an economic meltdown among the poorest of the planets. I mean, the, the, some of the richest got richer during the pandemic. But all of the poorest got poorer and they became more vulnerable. That's, but, that's what we have to face. But to move away from generalities, what, give me some specifics of the kinds of things your, your teams around the globe are facing because of the pandemic. Uh, oh, we did a survey um, among the people we serve. Uh, three quarters lost income, lost all income, basically. Three quarters were now skipping meals. And when you skip meals, it's not just you, you become hungry. People are then forced to sell themselves, uh, their, 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 uh, them, themselves on this, uh, in the sex market. Children have to take up arms and are recruited to, to armed groups, etc. Forced evictions have gone through the roof because people cannot pay the little rent they could before on for their modest dwelling. They are now without a home. They are homeless. They are also much, much more vulnerable. That's what we're facing are, are people on, on the ground and they are underfunded in their protection planning and needs. Jan, we're going to have to move through one second, but before we go, tell me a little bit from your perspective about what protection needs to do. We'll be talking more to William Chamley about this later on in our panel, but what would you like to see in order for protection colleagues to make that case with the donors? There's something specific about protection that needs the funds. Well, what we have to say, I think, is, listen, together we did fantastic achievements in assistance. You know, I'm an old man, uh, Chris, 15 years ago, I led the... <laughs> You're not that uh, old, Jan. <laughs> uh, pretty old, uh, because 15 years ago, I led the humanitarian reform of a humanitarian system, and Darfur was in crisis. Two things was our, 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 our first priorities. The lack of water and sanitation, wash, and the abuse of especially women 
as they were collecting firewoods. I mean, it was up, uh, President Bush, <laughs> Prime Minister Blair, etc., were discussing this at the time. Since then, we've made a quantum leap in providing water and sanitation, even shelter, disease control, food, nutrition. We have education and emergency. We've made big progress. We've not made commensurate progress on protection. We can do protection. So donors work with us to make a quantum leap on, of, of protection so that these families, women, children, do not suffer alone when the attackers are coming again and again, and we're not there, we're not helping or protecting them in their hour of greatest need. Jan, we'll be coming back to you at the end, but thank you so much for that intervention. I'm sure the donors took note. You want to make a, a quantum leap in the world of protection, and you need their help in making that leap. Thank you so much, Jan Eglund. Well, next to Mayadlin Vergara Perez, regional coordinator for the Fundacion Renancer, who's also the Caribbean regional coordinator for the foundation, which, since its launch in 1988, has helped more than 22,000 children and adolescents in Colombia that have survived gender-based and sexual violence. Maya, Colombia has recorded more than a million COVID cases and over 32,000 deaths. Um, Welcome to the panel, by the way. How has the panel impacted the children and adolescents that you are assisting? Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for having me, Grace. First of all, the, our, the home has remained open throughout the pandemic. And since the beginning, we have received further 20 children because the pandemic has frozen everything but those who abuse children. Hundreds of children have been confined to their homes with their abusers. And this has meant that we had to make sure that our doors remain, remained open for them. Thank you. That's a very good reminder. And I'm sure that child protection in the situation of homes which are shut up will be a leitmotif that we'll hear more and more throughout this discussion. Um, my, the NRC protection cluster report is clear that COVID has rendered vulnerable people even more vulnerable, as you've just been saying. Give me some more human examples of how that has affected real named individuals, human beings, individuals that you're working with. Yes, during the first four months, we developed strategies online to carry on working on our online actions, but tending to survivors on the streets, the help has not been enough. Some girls have told us about sexual abuse through social media, and this means we need to work face-to-face -face with them to find pathways to protect them. Another situation was that the families of the children that are in our home are on the streets. They are not able to pay their rents. And this has caused a great amount of anxiety amongst these girls, and some of which have decided to leave our foundation, our home, in order to go and help their families. A 14-year-old girl decided to leave this process to go and help her family, even if this means being subjected to sexual exploitation. We have worked hard to make sure this does not happen, and we have tried to manage some help with shopping and food and water for indigenous populations and vulnerable groups that are experiencing very serious needs and protection needs. But the, when children are hungry or thirsty, this becomes even more difficult. Thank you. My thanks for that. You've touched on this a bit, but tell me a bit more about how your work has changed in response to these new realities forced on us by the pandemic. Yes, the change has been being able to operate in a virtual environment. A part of our work needs this face-to-face -face contact. So after four or five months, we worked hard to be on the ground because we need this interaction and we need this closeness to the girls for a girl to decide to go through this therapeutic process in the foundation, a phone is not enough, social media is not enough. We need that human interaction 
so that they make the decision because it's a voluntary process. So they decide to go through this therapeutic process and to spend time in the foundation to be protected. And this has the work we have been doing, but it has it has been very difficult during the pandemic, access to healthcare, education, and the anxiety that this confinement has caused at home for these children not being able to see their families has been very, very difficult. Over to you. Thank you. My, um, I, I want to ask you a very difficult question now. With this funding gap, I imagine you're having to make choices. Some might use the expression playing God. Tell me about that ter terrible dilemma, those dilemmas you're having to face because of having to prioritise programmes because of the funding gap. La violencia sexual y la explotación sexual. sexual violence and sexual exploitation has to be worked in a comprehensive way. Prevention is needed, but if we have, while there are survivors, we need to tend to them. At times, we need to make these decisions between strengthening prevention processes or strengthening the attention for them, the services for them. We work with the children in, in the foundation where they are protected and recovering emotionally. But the families also need some of this work and attention for which we lack resources. And to reintegrate a girl after having undergone this therapeutic process in a context where there is no livelihood, where the socioeconomic situation is dire and there is a hostile environment, these children are once again at risk. So we need a comprehensive attention for the children and their families. And for these, we need significant resources. Over to My you. Thank you, Maya. A couple of very quick questions. Um, Manuel touched on this in the first of his three points, and that's about political will. Um, let me ask you, if suddenly you've got all the money you needed for your work in Colombia, you could do everything. Are you confident that, you know, the Colombian government would give you the environment in which you could achieve all of those things? We're getting here um, at this distinction between political will and humanitarian need. The government finance is always helpful, but I believe that we need on the one hand, political will, but then on the other hand, for civil society and communities to have access to information with regards to the management of resources. And this empowers communities and also ensures the transparency of the process. And it ensures that the resources will reach the hands of the people who need them in a manner that is proportional to their needs. Over to you, thanks. My one, one very last question. Um, you have senior representatives of the donor community with you right now, live on this panel. What's your message to them, both in terms of closing the funding gap, but also political pressures, let's call it? I think that working together with donors, financing is crucial. But it's also very important to work hand in hand to open new paths and new possibilities that allows us to understand what these children, these survivors are experiencing, their needs, their dreams, their aspirations, in order to come up with a human answer that brings us closer together to understand their needs and to understand what are their needs and interests and also to listen to them and to understand what they can offer. Over to you. My thank you so much. And I'm sure those are themes which we will um, return to. And let me just say to all the panelists, by the way, a message from our wonderful interpreters, particularly when you come to figures, please speak a little slowly um, so that the uh, interpreters can get those figures right. So my thank you. I'd like now to bring in Gillian Triggs, Assistant High Commissioner for Protection at UNHCR. Gillian, the new report covers six priority areas, Central African Republic, Cameroon, Sahel, Mozambique, Yemen and Venezuela. Set out some broad themes in these places about how the coronavirus is changing priorities uh, on the ground, protection priorities on the ground. 
Well, those those countries have, of course, been chosen as ones where we have very particular protection challenges. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Ambassador Bessler has, has said, just as in the last few days, we've seen reports of, um, of beheadings in, in Mozambique. We've seen a, a reports of 100 farmers killed um, in, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, we, the, the, this is an area, particularly in the Sahel in Africa, where the impact of COVID is even more powerful than, than, than other parts of the world. Um, uh, perhaps I can repeat the point that he's made, that COVID has, has been um, a magnifying and exacerbating uh, pandemic, unprecedented, and one has to be careful about how often we use that word, but an unprecedented uh, layer upon existing crises. And many of the crises in the Sahel, we've simply forgotten or never knew they existed or don't care. They're too far away. Uh, many people can't even place many countries in the Sahel, Niger, uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Mali, can't even place them on a map. Uh, and yet they are countries where very significant numbers of people are being uh, displaced, typically by conflict, uh, but also by, by the impact of climate change. Um, uh, environmental degradation, uh, conflict often stimulated by, by uh, concerns over resources. Sure, and the if impact. I could, sorry to interrupt you, we'll pick up on those things actually in uh, later on. We've, we're going to speak specifically about climate refugees, climate migrants. Um, on the question of our gender-based violence, which is something that we've begun to um, refer to. Um, you heard Maya talk about women and girls, children, particularly in closed homes. Um, what is your experience on the ground? Has COVID dramatically increased incidence of, uh, of GBV? And if so, can you give us some numbers? Well, the, the, yes, the, the impact of COVID um, has been, it's been incremental in the sense that with lockdowns, um, the most vulnerable people have been in the informal economy, they've lost their jobs, uh, it's led to family tensions and led to very significant spikes across the world in, uh, in domestic violence and ultimately in gender-based violence. And we've seen extraordinary numbers. Um, our call centres, for example, have had 10 times the number of calls looking for assistance uh, in violence, uh, in, in the context of gender-based violence. Shelters have been closed down or are no longer available. Uh, agencies are not available to assist. But we've also seen flowing on from those consequences, evictions, as has been pointed out, but we're also seeing uh, rises noticed by our field officers, by, by uh, more than 400 uh, country officers of um, child abuse, uh, children being brought into labour, uh, uh, forced into labour. Uh, we're seeing trafficking rising uh, and being noticed across almost all of our, our field officers. Um, so we're seeing an exacerbation of crises that have been in existence for some time. Now, Gillian, other themes in the six crisis areas of the NRC Protection Cluster Report include forced displacement. We've touched on that xenophobia, stigmatization, discrimination in access to health, food, water, education and legal services. Which of these really keep you up at night? Which of these are giving you the biggest headache in your, uh, in your fields of operation? Well, when I, I think about, I try to think about this as deeply as I can. And of course, this is the 70th anniversary of the, of the Refugee Convention, uh, and, and we're being a little reflective. Uh, but I think um, that the key is, is, uh, is conflict uh, and the need to manage conflict and, and to look at root causes. But in terms of the, the sort of work that we're seeing in our field offices is, is really the rise of trafficking. I think that is, that is um, a cruel... And, and horrible consequence of economic uh, loss, of loss of, of housing, uh, women, uh, large numbers of women traveling, uh, leaving Venezuela, and nearly 50% of them traveling alone. They're very vulnerable. Children are vulnerable. Um, and so we see very high rises in trafficking. In the, in the Yemen, uh, for example, uh, we're seeing um, uh, something like two thirds of young girls are married before they're 18. These are mechanisms very often in cultures where it's acceptable for young, young women to be married off, but it's also a way of dealing with economic challenges. So we're seeing a, a great level of interconnected consequences that reflect uh, the, 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 the climate crisis, the, uh, the COVID crisis, but also we're seeing now a long-term and probably very, very hard to resolve social and economic impact. 
Julian, I want to put some questions to you about financing, because that's absolutely what this report is around. Protection as a sector um, is underfunded in part because people think it doesn't save lives. Now, what can we do to change that narrative? Well, I think, the, the, of course, the answer is protection does change lives uh, and it saves lives. But how um, do you convince the donors? How do you convince well, the wide world out there of that? Well, that, that, is, that is the question. Um, I don't have a clear answer except to say that we do need new ideas. We, we have, you've described, or the, and the Ambassador Bessler has described this huge gulf that it is growing uh, between protection needs, uh, 800, 8 million, 80 million rather, for UNHCR displaced people, many more millions in need of protection of one kind or another. And yet we have a funding gap that's growing, not declining. Now, many countries will say, we have a huge COVID um, problem. We must protect our, our public health. We must protect our borders. Uh, our priority lies with our own citizens. Then the argument that we, mu we must be more persuasive in making the argument that if countries protect uh, those that are displaced, in need of protection, then that will alleviate many other problems. Uh, so it will. Just, sorry, let me just jump in here. The donor response is often we need humanitarian leadership to give protection the support it's, it needs. Now, um, do you think that the so-called principles of the Interagency Standing Committee should take a role? I know that Filippo Grandi is not with us, but you know, UNHCR could. Do you think that it's time that the principles are recommitted to protection? Well, I think that would send a very powerful message, but, uh, but I'd have to say that my experience is that through the various uh, uh, interagency bodies, um, often driven by the, the leadership of the Secretary General himself, those principles do come together and are attempting to work together. And I think, I think that's a very positive response. Uh, but I think we need leadership that gets to those people who are going to make the political decisions. Uh, we have to bring the public with us and we have to both have the data, which has also been mentioned today, uh, the evidence in the data, but we need to bring the stories with that data. Um, but we certainly need to be thinking more originally about how we get these messages across. Well, uh, I'm certainly going to be talking to William Chamley, who I just saw standing next to you later on, about how protection communicates itself, particularly to the donors. But Gillian, just before I leave you, as I said earlier in my introduction, 68% of the funding for protection is coming from just five donors. Uh, I assume you have a message for those donors who aren't in that top five, but who are nonetheless quite wealthy. Yes, and that is, that is, again, part of the persuasive and advocacy role that we, we try to play here at the UN Refugee Agency, and, of course, uh, uh, High Commissioner does. It is a huge problem that although we have great generosity from five countries, uh, the EU, the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, and, and others down the list, it's a tiny number of states are actually funding most of the humanitarian work. That is the challenge to broaden the base and to encourage other states to, to, to make a contribution. And can I say, we have a roadmap for doing this. We have an agreement, and that's the Global Compact on Refugees and, of course, on migration as well. And what I'd suggest is that the, the COVID has, in a way, shown the, the, the value of the principle of the compacts, and that is solidarity and shared responsibility. Now, that message was agreed two years ago, but, the, but then we've been hit by COVID. And of course, that has had an impact. But, but, the, but COVID has demonstrated that in a way that almost nothing else could, why we need the principle of shared responsibility globally. Okay, and that's the bit we have to work on. OK, and that's the bit, incidentally, we'll be talking to the donors about in the question and answer section later. Gillian, it's great to have you with us. Thank you very much indeed for sharing your thoughts. Let's move now to Cecilia jimenez Damery whose reports to the General Assembly this year focused on those displaced in the context of climate change and sets out the obligations of states to deal with them. Cecilia, your report quotes some eye-watering figures indicating that if things continue as they are, over 143 million people in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and Latin America alone could be forced to move within their own countries by 2050 because of climate change. What impact has the COVID pandemic already had on them? And what impact do you think it will continue to have if nothing is done? And can I just tell everyone, it's now one o'clock in the morning in the Philippines where Cecilia said, so thank you so much for staying up for us. We're very grateful. Over to you.
Thank you so much, uh, Chris. And actually, it's almost two o'clock in the morning, but I'm very happy to be here indeed. The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, have, have hit the most vulnerable population the hardest. It has exacerbated existing inequalities and vulnerabilities, including those communities who are vulnerable to disasters in hazard prone zones and the risk to displacement. IDPs, regardless of the cause of their displacement in the very first place, are at heightened risk of uh, exposure to COVID-19. Why? They have limited access to healthcare, water, sanitation, food, adequate housing. They often face uh, discrimination. Many IDPs, because of displacement and even later on exacerbated by COVID-19, have lost their livelihoods owing to the ongoing crisis. They're sliding into poverty, unable to afford essential goods and housing, and are at risk of eviction. For those in camps, for example, I have been receiving news from many different countries where they cannot leave the camps. And usually, some, a lot of these IDPs would go to the nearest town, the nearest community, in order to have their livelihood. But because of lockdowns, they cannot move. So the COVID-19 crisis has, as I said, exacerbated the vulnerability of communities also to natural hazards. Um, while climate change increases the frequency and intensity of these hazards. And of course, these, these result to a higher risk of disaster and displacement. Now, while difficult to measure, Movement restrictions imposed by governments to contain the spread of the virus are expected, of course, have hampered human mobility. And this is also in the context of slow onset adverse effects of climate change, including the adaptive movement that would have had the potential to minimize the risk of the disaster occurring. For example, in, in, in a place where there's low onset um, uh, hazards, uh, uh, effects of slow onset climate change, people need to move. What with COVID-19, how can they move? And therefore their vulnerability is much more exposed. Indeed. Point well made. Let me just jump in. Um, you're describing a double whammy, COVID and climate migrants. Yeah. Um, how, given the financial realities that this new report makes perfectly clear, what's your perspective? How does that change responses on the ground, specifically on these two areas that you've highlighted? Okay, um, well, my, my report to General Assembly that I, I um, provided, I uh, reported on uh, just last October, uh, really focused on displacement in the context of slow onset adverse effects of climate change, such as sea level rise, increasing temperatures, desertifications, you know, things that you do not see immediately are not dramatic, are not su sudden. Now, the common misconception, first of all, including for funding, is that protection needs in relation to disaster displacement and especially all slow onset hazards are less relevant than in displacement triggered by armed conflict. In reality, both are important. Persons, of course, in conflict, but also persons who are internally displaced, owing to disasters facing significant protection risk, given the extensive impacts of displacement on the enjoyment of their rights, their needs are often overlooked in laws, policies, and as well as funding. Now, under, understanding and responding to this particular type of displacement can be particularly challenging because the, 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 the processes uh, take, take place over an extended you know, time, period of time and can also affect a large geographic area. When you introduced me, you, you, you cited uh, this, this figure of 143 million. Um, it's horrifying. Uh, yeah, it is, it is. And that's only an underestimation and that only looks at three regions in the world. So, while this displacement, displacement in this context is expected to be mostly long-term, certain areas will become more and more uninhabitable. Therefore, 
the international community and donors should ensure that funding and programs also address of these also address the needs of these types of IDPs from prevention, from mitigation and adoption, ad adaptation where possible to protection when they need to be displaced. And some of these displaced may not even be able to go back. So, um, so, yeah. so, so to be clear, this is really... You, your message to the donors specifically on this point is look at the comprehensive, look at the big picture. Don't just exactly. fight the pandemic from a health perspective, fight it from a, a holistic protection perspective. Definitely. Well, in terms of coverage, of, of coverage, COVID responses, our fight against COVID, as you, as you rightly say it, it's, it's not just health, as, as you say. It's, we should also look at the social economic impact of the pandemic and also what are the consequences of the measures adopted by governments to contain the spread of the virus. The enjoyment of social economic and cultural rights have been heavily impacted. And moreover, please let's not forget, human rights are interrelated and indivisible. It is therefore always essential to understand this interrelationship because lockdowns, for example, uh, have affected not only SC rights, as such as the right to livelihood, as I have um, described, but civil and political rights as well. A, a woman, or, for example, who has been subject to gender-based violence because of the confinement, the increase of domestic violence, usually carries her vulnerability to her access and guarantee of her other human rights. So protection and human rights should be the basis for, you know, for, for all actors, not just health so, actors. So and, sorry, yeah. please. Please, no, yeah, please. please. Oh, yes. Saying, and, uh, and, okay. Please. And, and just one last line. Um, and in all of these, you were asking a while ago, how, how can we, we make the case um, for, for funding for protection? And of course, I would like to throw in the COVID and climate change as well. Well, there is that importance of the participation of the people themselves, the internally displaced persons. We should be, actually, it would be great to have IDPs in, in a panel like this so that they can tell us how they think, what they think we should tell the, do the donors. And actually, they could tell the donors themselves. <laughs> we'll hear more from the donors about that in, 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 later on. Uh, last question for you, Cecilia. As the only member of the Interagency Standing Committee, you heard, you heard me talking to Gillian Triggs about this just now. The idea that there should be given senior level political support, prioritising protection at the centre. You heard Manuel talk about the centrality um, of protection and humanitarian responses. Would you back a meeting, say, in the next six months of the principles of the Interagency Standing Committee to do precisely that, to send that signal that Gillian Triggs talked about? Yes. <laughs> well, you've, you, you've helped me a lot there because I need to catch up on this. <laughs> okay. The answer is a godsend. Thank you so much. Thank you so uh, much. Lovely to have you. Get some sleep now. Or stay with us. It's up to you. Uh, we now move to William Shamily, coordinator of the Global Protection Cluster. William, as I said in the introduction, the Global Protection Forum, all the protection clusters around the world, have spent the last four months meeting online. I cannot imagine what four months of Zoom meetings must have been like. Um, but could you sum up what your conclusions are in brief for us, William? Hello? William, I can see you, I can't hear you. Very good, thank you very much, Chris. I'm very so good. pleased with this panel and these messages to be closing this global forum that we started a few months ago. We brought together, as you said, 3,000 frontline responders, diplomats, actors from the development and the, the humanitarian sector. And really the focus was how do we deal with delivering protection in this era of, of COVID? And I would like to highlight today three takeaways. Uh, that are uh, very important uh, for the field operation and actually represent the state of protection response in the field as we speak today. First, protection actors stayed and delivered responses that actually saved lives, despite all what happened in the COVID area. And this has been amazing to hear in the forum, how the different organizations in different countries around the world really focused on adapting 
their responses on changing their partnerships, go more local uh, with the partners to actually stay and deliver. So this imagination and adaptation is basically this attitude of we do not take no for an answer when it comes to protection access. And what was no accident for this year is just a few days ago, uh, the Central Emergency Response Fund adopted 26 protection services as life-saving activities. This is the first time it happened since what Jan spoke about 15 years ago of the start of the system. So we're very pleased uh, with this. And that's a, a, an initial takeaway from the, uh, from the forum. The second, we have a number of areas of protection that are up and running. They have been a series of investments over the last year in child protection, in gender-based violence response, in mine action, in housing, land, and property, in providing legal assistance. These areas, they have clear leadership. They have commitments of many partners that can actually deliver at scale on the ground. The investment of the international community in these areas have worked. There is a return on investment. So all what we need now is to pump up give the resources for these actors that are working in these areas to deliver in a way that is commensurate to the needs. There are other areas where COVID has really shown where we really need to consolidate and mainly because these areas are beyond the remits of protection actors alone. These areas such as mental health and psychosocial support, such as trafficking in persons, such as communication with community and providing information that saves lives, uh, such as real inclusion of persons with disability and elderly in any kind of response from humanitarian to development. These William, can, areas, I, can I push you along to your third point, please? Yeah. These areas uh, require uh, stronger consolidation and support from the uh, international organizations and uh, from the donors. And that takes me to the third point. It's simple. The third point is that protection local actors are the key. They are the key. It's not a takeaway. It's a fact. It's simple. What doesn't make sense is that those who have the best access to deliver protection assistance have the worst access to resources. Let me repeat. Those actors who have the best possible access to deliver protection on the ground have the worst access to resources. We need to change that. That's a very, very good point, William. So can you give Maya some good news? I mean, if we're going to say those things, and they're absolutely true, are you going to prioritise local organisations like Maya's, others working at the local level doing protection? We must. It's our only realistic strategy. You know, we committed five years ago in the grand bargain. What I commit to today is that next year, when the protection clusters are planning for 2022, 25%, one quarter of our aid planned will be directed from and directed to local actors. This is a grand bargain commitment and we will stick to it. We are fulfilling our part of the deal. I hope the funding will follow. We'll do a bit more than hope that the funding will follow. Well, we'll get an indication, I think, when we open this up for the donors. But let me ask you, what will protection look like if this huge gap continues? I mean, what will protection look like in five years' time if the current trends continue? This, is, this question requires a, a, a comprehensive answer. I think the first thing I would like to say that when any humanitarian sector takes a hit, protection of people takes a hit. And uh, in a reversed way, when protections, when the humanitarian sectors are well resourced, then protection risks can be reduced. Let me illustrate this. When a family has a, has a roof above their head, when they have shelter, they are less likely or they have a better chance not to marry off their young daughter so she can have a roof above her head. Shelter protects. When a family has food on the table uh, and they don't have to really send off their young boy to go and work so everyone can eat. We see that food protects and so is water and sanitation and so is education and so is all the humanitarian sector. So when we look at protection financing, it's very important that we look at the big ball of the humanitarian funding because all the humanitarian sectors protect. That said, there are specific interventions that require dedicated support. And uh, here are the facts. At the beginning of 2021, 
we have planned to deliver aid for 58 million people. That required $2 billion. We stand today at the end of the year. We have received one quarter of these needs. So concretely, 40 million people that we know what they need, we're able to respond to, we have the readiness, we will not be able to provide the assistance they need. It's that simple. It's choices that are made impossible on the ground. And the last point, and I want to link to your question to, to Gillian on how can we sell better protection. Protection doesn't need to be sold. Protection is not a marketing game. This is a commitment that the humanitarians and member states have made together. No one is here to sell anything to anyone. We're committed together as partners to deliver protection. And there is a problem that protection issues that we're dealing with are very difficult. No one really wants to deal with them. They're tough. They are uh, risky because progress of years can be reversed in days. They are discreet and yet they hold the soul of the humanitarian action, standing by those people who are in the most vulnerable situation and being with them in dignity. Those people won't raise their hands to tell you they are in trouble. They won't. These people will not even be able to celebrate once they have managed to overcome or survive a protection problem. The loudest protection success is proven by its invisibility. And that's the fact, that's what we chose as an international community to deal with. So when we are talking about uh, protection, I would like to say, if you are a protection actor, if you are a member state, if you are an individual, a development actor, and you want to be part of a, this one success of our generation, I would say invest in protection on no regret basis because protection is right and it works. Now, William, picking up on that thing, what I said to a friend of mine from Save the Children I was speaking to, she said, oh, you made a, a brilliant point a while ago about the need to invest in children. And she gave me this very startling figure that in, I think she said, Somalia and Yemen, children make up 55 and 54 percent of the populations respectively. There is a solid case, is there not, for investing specifically in the protection of children? Absolutely. I mean, children are half of the population we deal with. That stands on its own. It's not only a half that deserves protection. It's an influential half. If you really serve the children well, then you're really influencing their parents and aunts and the community altogether. That's one. Two, what's even more important is that uh, the sector of protection support, of protection of children, uh, is a mature sector. It's solid. We have the right mechanism. We have the right tools. We have the right partners. So in an otherwise very volatile humanitarian uh, environment, investing in children is the soundest thing, the most solid thing you can do as a humanitarian actor. Now, I want to ask you something else. I mean, something that's come up is this question of under asking, that in certain situations, we're asking for too little from donors. Now, I understand that's something which the Global Protection Cluster is all going to also going to start looking at. We don't ask too little. We uh, have responsible machineries of deciding how much we ask. We measure the needs. We also look at what's being realistic in terms of response, in terms of access, in terms of capacity of partners. And we ask for the amount of resources that we can actually use in a responsible way uh, in, in countries. Now, should we do more? Yes, the needs are much more even than what we plan for. And this is where we really need to look beyond the humanitarian sector to develop, deliver protection. We need to look at the peace sector. We need to look at development actors that through their interventions can also help in delivering protection outcomes. William, it's pure joy to hear you speak, and I'd love to hear you speak more, but we really have to move on. And we will come back to you, I think, during, no, I, I, I don't think, I, I know, uh, during, the, uh, during the question and answer session. I now need to hand back to um, Manuel Bessler. Um, Manuel, um, 
I'd like to end um, by, by getting you to put on your Swiss hat. Um, first of all, I hope that we've delved into those three areas that you set us at the beginning in your intervention, but your response to that, but specifically with your Swiss donor hat on, I give you the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks indeed for the panelists and their intervention. Yes, I think we scratched on, on uh, a lot of them, but it shows how complex the, the, the issue of protection is. When you ask me as a donor, what are you going to do? I think here we have a good manual, a good guidelines what to do. This report lines or lists the recommendation. It has findings, that's recommendation. And of course, as a donor, I first of all go to the recommendation. First recommendation, convene in collaboration with the GPC, the Global Protection Cluster, an annual donor meeting starting in June 21. Herewith, I say Switzerland is more than happy to be um, co-host of this annual meeting in order to see where are we, to take, talk, to, to take stocks, where, what kind of I don't know, step we have done. So count us in and, um, and uh, count on Switzerland on this. Um, the good humanitarian donorship. Switzerland right now, together with uh, ECHO, is still the chair of the good humanitarian donorship. Yes, there we want to bring this advocacy work more to bear um, that the centrality of um, um, protection has to be seen in every action that we do in humanitarian aid. So we have to think, we have to live protection. And this is a, an advocacy work. Of course, Chris, I know you want to have figures. Um, and yes, also Switzerland will increase our funding uh, for, for protection. Money helps a lot. And money is important, of course, but um, it's not all. We will increase our um, uh, financial contribution. We'll increase our um, human resource contribution with secondees in order to boost the um, protection um, response. And I think, indeed, this report helps us a lot to do this step that, that uh, Jan mentioned. Well, well, can I ask you a very quick, a quick supplementary question? You heard Jan, Jan Eglin say, together with the donor community, um, protection specialists want to take a quantum leap, is how he phrased it. And you also heard William saying that this is not transactional. We're not trying to sell you something. We're not trying to communicate. It is an obligation. So what, what is your response to those two ideas? A quantum leap from Jan and William's idea of let's get away from this transaction. Don't sell me protection. It is an obligation on the donor community. Look, um the quantum leap. We have to move on from describing the problem of protection to do protection, to live protection. And there, um, my call is leadership. We need leadership in protection. We need leadership from the donors. We need leadership from the ERC, the Emergency Relief uh, Coordinator. We need leadership in the ISC. The ISC, the International uh, Inter um, uh, Agency, Standing uh, Committee. Agency Standing Committee. Now I got it. Um, has brings all these actors together. There we have ProCap, the the protection capacity. There you can show um, that you mean business when you deploy people, when you support HCs and humanitarian country teams in the field with the necessary uh, capacity. They improve the ProCap uh, capacity, and here we can do more than only describing the problem. One word to William. I agree, among the converted, we don't have to sell, but I saw one of the chat saying also, listen, I go tomorrow back to the parliament and I have to ask for money. So how do I explain them, give me money for protection? The question comes, what the hell is protection? We need a narrative that is tangible. We need Yes, we need stories. And I like the story from William about the shelter that is, is a way to protection, that this contributes protection. That's why protection is so vast, but we need to have it more concrete, more tangible and not fluffy out there and a commitment that is important. I don't deny it, but we have to make it tangible for, in the end, uh, the people in the street who pay with their taxes um, the money we can hopefully also contribute and to increase to protection. I, I need to move on, Manuel. Before I do, I want to defend one of my panellists. William was anything but fluffy, but we'll come back to him uh, later on. I'd like, if I may, uh, to turn to Leslie Zimmern of the US State Department's PRM, Populations, Refugees and Migration. Hello, Leslie. Now, you've talked about the dialogue. I've seen communication with you about the dialogue that's been going on with the protection community. What 
what should the humanitarian community's key priorities be in applying the lessons learned and positioning themselves over the next year to better address the protection needs we've been hearing about? Over to you, Leslie. Thank you, and thank you for that question, and thank you to the Global Protection Cluster for all the work on the report. I'm going to echo many of the comments that have already been made by the panelists um, on developing concrete commitments to address the protection challenges facing the most vulnerable populations. As we've heard from all the panelists, we're seeing alarming deterioration of protection conditions as a result of COVID-19, and we all need to do more collectively to address this deterioration. The United States is committed not only to mitigating the worst impacts of the crisis now, but we look forward to working with all of you to creating lasting impact by supporting the key recommendations emphasized here today. Uh, to focus on sort of what we would see as the priority areas for the next year, uh, we would like to suggest we focus on the, the mid-year review in the report, as well as the increased focus on gender-based violence, and increased advocacy for protection needs. We view the proposal to initiate the mid-year review on protection needs and set our approach for the remainder of the year as, as a critical approach, allowing us to perform more frequent assessments of our progress, and most importantly, to be able to respond more nimbly to rapidly shifting protection needs, particularly in this new COVID-19 environment. Um, we would hope that a mid-year review would enable our protection services to be more impactful in reaching those who need them most. And we look forward to working with the protection cluster to support this recommendation and encourage others to do so as well. Leslie, okay. thanks. Sorry, sorry, please make yeah, another no, I was gonna say. Over the next year, we also really wanna urge everybody, not, it has, has been said by many of the panelists, not to lose sight um, of the specific alarming increase in gender-based violence and that requires extra attention. Um, you know, our efforts to minimize COVID-19 transmission are not only limiting access to gender-based violence, child protection, prevention, and response services, but also putting people at greater risk for domestic and gender-based violence. Um, our partners are implementing gender-based violence prevention and response activities, including through our Safe from the Start initiative. And we're trying to adapt quickly to ensure that those in need can access information and services. We, but we do urge the entire community to prioritize, resource, and advocate for protection services and to build best practices that will address gender-based violence and risk to children into our protection system over the coming year. And then lastly, um, as I think was mentioned at the beginning, um, we agree that meaningful progress on protecting vulnerable populations doesn't just require protection financing, but also requires advocating to host governments to strengthen the protection environment for vulnerable populations. The United yep. States sees protection advocacy and financing as complementary, and that both need to work together to lay the groundwork for improved con protection conditions. So we hope that we can continue to join with others here today to ensure we move forward on both financing and advocacy uh, in the year ahead. And we, I thank the Global Protection Cluster and all the panelists for advancing these key priorities today. Good. Leslie, thank you so much. This is a high level panel and we have to move on to some other high level folks. So I'd now like to move to Sweden and Anna Jarfelt, um, permanent representative of Sweden to the UN in Geneva. Um, Sweden has long been a strong supporter of making protection central with a particular emphasis on reaching protection outcomes. In the light though, Anna, of the current pandemic, the challenges of persistent, un persistent underfunding, what concrete measures would Sweden recommend in order to scale up perhaps that, that change that Jan Eglund's been talking about. Thank you so much, Chris. And let me just start by thanking the excellent panelists. It's really been a privilege to be able to yeah, listen yeah. to one from, yeah, from yeah. them. But when it comes to your, your question, uh, let me first say that uh, as others have been mentioning, our assessment is that we have a good set of policies and guidelines and tools for achieving the centrality of protection already today. But what we need to do is to ensure that these policies and guidelines that they actually trickle down to the level of projects and programs on the ground and actually gets implemented. But um, uh, another, another important uh, factor for us is also that we need to change uh, our view on how we perceive protection. Uh, we read, I think we need to recognize that protection is the outcome that we want to achieve in the form of a reduced risk and not primarily as the activities that we put in place to respond to the needs that arise from violence and abuse. Uh, 
And I think one way of, of getting there, if I could just give one example, Please. is that we, I think we need to carry out a more context-specific protection analysis to better actually understanding the risks. Those best placed to understand and inform us about the risks as donors are the affected people themselves. And therefore, community-based approaches to protection needs to be further developed. Uh, this is also uh, um, when it comes to, to our roles as, as donors, we also understand that we have an important role here to play, both when it come to, comes to supporting humanitarian actors in developing and also to implement these tools. This is why Sweden, for example, have been supporting the World Food Programme of the last two years in the development of the organization's new protection policy, which was actually approved uh, last week. But then also let me just finally say that uh, in line with the, with the report, uh, we very much from the Swedish side also commits to work together in dialogue with our donor colleagues on how we can work more effectively together towards operationalizing protection outcomes and making sure protection is about preventing violence and abuse, not just to responding to it. But let me just on a more personal note say finally also that I think it's important. I mean, you mentioned that there are five main donors into this cluster. This this group needs to be widened, and this is important. We are today speaking a little bit to the converted, uh, uh, converted uh, donors here today, and I think it's important that this is a discussion that is also reaching out even more broadly. But thank you so much for the opportunity that you gave me to speak here today. Thank Anna, you. Th thank you for your intervention. That's great. And just to pick up uh, on something that Anna said, and to bring in, if I may, Sally Mansfield, who's the Australian ambassador and permanent rep to the UN in Geneva, uh, touching again on this, um, the local actors um, question, which, you know, William, we heard Maya also. Um, uh, let me ask you, uh, Sally, what can we, how can we address current and future protection challenges in ways that promote community engagement and accountability? Yeah, thanks very much indeed for that. Um, and I think we're all looking for silver linings to COVID. And perhaps one of them is that the disruptions have actually obliged us to pick up the pace on localization. We heard William talking about it. It's really been a, a, a critical theme. And in our region, in the Asia Pacific, we have seen that supporting leadership uh, by local and by national actors on protection responses has delivered significant advantages. I mean, these are the people who will usually best understand community protection needs and local protection mechanisms. When disasters hit, uh, women are often the first responders and uh, they, they, they often jump in very quickly to keep children and community members safe. Um, in Vanuatu, for example, the Society for People with a Disability has done some work reflecting on the evolution of disaster and protection responses since um, a really bad cyclone, Cyclone Pam, in 2015. And in that, there was a huge international effort that was mobilised. But five years later, with Cyclone Harold, where the response was under Vanuatu's leadership, that more localised response to Cyclone Harold supported greater leadership by women. And Vanuatu's whole of government leadership made much, much greater use of local skills, local knowledge of the civil society partners. Um, I, I think we've also seen that crises exacerbate pre-existing inequalities. Um, often that's for women and girls, um, those with a disability, Indigenous um, people of diverse gender identities. Um, so something else that Australia has been doing in particular is to really try and drive support for local partners who are addressing increasing gender-based violence in Cox's Bazaar um, to support the Rohingya community. And there, community members are being mobilised to deliver protection activities, such as around gender-based violence. And this provi provides uh, better protection because it draws on community knowledge community networks and local trust. And that's really important. So community engagement, I think, can strengthen ownership and actually accountability, which is also important for donors. So these are a couple of so examples. Mm. 
Thanks. Can I, can I just interrupt you? I'd like to just come to the floor a bit. We've had quite a few questions, and there's one question that relates specifically to this whole question of local actors. Um, a question that speaks particularly to protection work um, was how do we ensure that when we are increasing the use of local actors in our frontline protection work, we aren't simply transferring risks in some of those dangerous settings? Do you understand? I mean, Sally, I'm not sure if that's something you can or want to deal with, or if not, William or I'm sure Jan would take that. I mean, I, th I think it is an important question, and it's part of the the the, the risk analysis that uh, local communities and donors have to undertake. But I think the benefits of shifting the action to the local players has been demonstrated. They're the people who know um, what the community's response is going to be, who is hardest hit. Um, I think if you go to Jan or the others, they'll be able to talk in more. Yes, indeed. I mean, I'd actually like to go to Mayerlene, if I may. Jan, sorry, Jan, you turned on your, your screen. Just Mayerlene, I mean, you're hearing and um, great, you know, the, the bringing in local actors, discovering the new front lines, all these wonderful things, in a sense, must be music to your ears. On the other hand, do you have a sense that you're being put in situations of risk? And, you know, as Sally just said, we need to build in to our risk assessment those factors. Hi. Well, I do think it is just to try to achieve the balance, the right balance between to implement this in the communities, but also to not to let aside the responsibility of the government and the uh, responsibility of the cooperation of the nodes to be able to articulate efforts so that the community is and feels empowered and the others can work from the needs and the interest of the community and its population more specifically, but not to let all the responsibility to the communities. It is needed that the government, the governments, the international cooperation and social and civil society will work also in an articulated manner, following up the community in the technical issues, in the political issues and in the economic aspects. That's my, my answer. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for that perspective. I'd like to go back to some donors and bring in Natalie Olislacher, uh, the, the ambassador and deputy permanent representative of the Netherlands to the UN in Geneva. Um, ambassador, I, I, I gather you'd like to say something about what you haven't heard about neglected components in protection activities. So what haven't you heard in this panel discussion that you would like to have had some emphasis on? Over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And that is a hard question because, of course, <laughs> I've heard a lot of very important things that, that really need to be said. But indeed, um, we have tried to shed light on the importance of mental health and psychosocial support. And that is something that I would like to bring into this discussion as well. Uh, there are people with pre-existing conditions. That's the part of mental health, which really should also be taken care of. Uh, they are very, very vulnerable. Um, and we should not forget about them. Usually it's the invisible scars, as my minister uh, calls it. There's also people who are normally in a very good health um, and we should not treat it as a health issue, the psychosocial support part. Um, last year for the Red, Red, Red Cross Red Crescent Conference, we, um, we had this resolution that all the first responders should indeed be aware of what it means when people get traumatized because of the conflict and um, that they had to live through. And if we should address this, it is as important as water and shelter are. It is very important to address this. It's very important to also give first responders the, um, the knowledge, uh, what kind of questions to ask. Um, it's, it's maybe not that much money, but it's, it's, it's more also the knowledge. And as Ambassador of Australia also mentioned, COVID actually showed us how necessary it is on the one hand, but there's also a silver lining. We saw that we can also support from far away and we can also support with knowledge from um, a little bit further away. Um, a specific example that I wanted to give, and I'll be short because you have so many good questions to everybody, <laughs> but a specific example is um, when you have morning rituals, 
and you cannot really attend to them and people have lost loved ones. These are, these are very important issues that we have to address in order for people to rebuild their societies, in order for people to, to keep on living and, and find their place in the social fabric that they came from. So it's really a basic need and it's really part of protection. And I just also wanted to shed some light on that part in, the, in this uh, very, very good session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed for that intervention. I'd like now to turn to Norway and Ambassador Tina Merck-Smith, who I assume, Ambassador, correct me if I'm wrong, you are the ambassador to the UN in Geneva. Please forgive me. Correct me. Yes, indeed. I see you shaking your head. Um, Norway, congratulations, has been elected to the Security Council and you will take up your seat next year. Good luck with that one. Um, uh, but with the seat at the top table come responsibilities and we in the world of protection are looking to Norway to make the case for protection at that famous horseshoe table. Will you? Well that's the plan Chris, thank you so much for giving me the floor. We intend to continue to be exactly this, a champion and we will continue to look closely at how protection issues are integrated into the humanitarian response plan which receive an earmarked funding from, from our side. And because protection of civilians will be one of the four priorities for Norway in the Council, we will put a particular focus on this in all country situations on the Council's agenda. So let me say a couple of more words about that, about this. We will, first of all, we will try to seek broad agreement for principled humanitarian response in countries affected by conflict. This means building action on the humanitarian imperative and humanitarian principles of impartiality, humanity, neutrality, independence. And we see these principles as essential for ensuring access to protect and assist civilians trapped in conflict situations. At the same time, you said good luck. And well, <laughs> we are conscious that we need to avoid politicizing humanitarian efforts. We will, our plan is at least to maintain operational and results oriented approach. And we do think that it is possible to, to maintain a principal approach while also keeping an operational focus and rhetoric. And we, we know that this will requ require of us that, that we know the other Security Council members well, what their priorities are and where we have common interests. And it also requires that we know the country situations well and humanitarian needs well and support from the protection cluster in, in providing the, the timely and relevant country information will be crucial for us to be able to deliver on, on what we have, uh, what, what our ambitions are. And an example is that uh, with regards to Yemen, we don't have an embassy there. We cannot travel in the time of Corona. So having access to information about what actually goes on in the field, what are the in incidents related to protection of civilians, will be essential for our ability to make this difference that we would like to make. So we, we, we count on you to, to give us this, this input that we need in order to fulfill uh, our ambitions. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. For that. And we will be keeping a very close eye on your championing, Norway's championing in the Security Council of protection issues. Thank you so much for that intervention. I'd, allow, I'd now like to move away from some of the, uh, the donor representatives on this high-level panel and uh, talk about gender-based violence and bring in Choko Arakaki, Director of the Humanitarian Office at the UN Population Fund. Recognising that the protection of women and girls is central to the UN FPA mandate, can you tell us a bit more about how you engage on protection issues, specifically with women-led organisations? Chris, this is a great uh, uh, question, and then thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, from UNFPA's uh, uh, perspective. I think many things are already said, so I don't want to repeat many things. Um, Good, because we're in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But also, you know, I really want to emphasize, you know, that there are many, many uh, uh, challenges posed by the, uh, the uh, COVID and then its consequences. But UNFPA really, really confirmed localization really work. So bringing local uh, local uh, led organization and the women led organization into the, the 
uh, leadership for the, uh, the decision making, and then also the shared capacity. So this is not just you know, you, you, uh, international uh, community to build the capacity. So we have to think very differently. We do have a lot of potential at the local level. But when we talk about the financing and investment right now, so let me just one point, you know, the, the, tell you the one very specific point, what UNFPA does. UNFPA has allocated 30% of its entire humanitarian budget for human, uh, women-led local organization last year. We have been enhancing and then this approach, not just this year and then beyond this year. So this is something that you know, everybody has to follow. And then just the last week, you know, the final, uh, final point is that we began the 16 days GBB activ activism. There was an announcement of the SURF 25 US million dollars allocation for UNFPA and the new UN Women for the Gender-Based Violence. This multi-year innovative funding is very, very welcome. We do need more sustained, targeted, multi-year commi uh, commitment for our fundamental uh, uh, change and then sustainable solutions. And then women are consist of more, almost all the affected population for the humanitarian, uh, humanitarian response. And then women's are foundation for the community, society, and the resilient, resilient future. So if we don't uh, invest on the women, and then we can never recover any kind of humanitarian crisis, including COVID. So we now have to walk the talk, and then we really need to translate political will into the actions before it's becoming too late. So thank you, Chris. Here, here. Well said. Thank you so much indeed for that, Shoko. I'd like now to return to the theme of child protection and bring in Tasha Gill, Senior Advisor for Child Protection at UNICEF. Um, we've had this extraordinary experience of the pandemic. If a pandemic were to happen in three or four years time, have we yet, from your perspective, learned anything that would help us better protect children? Thank you so much. And I want to thank you for your earlier comments too, putting children really at the center of this conversation as well. And as we heard from Maya and so many of the fantastic panelists today, COVID-19 really put a spotlight on children's exposure to violence, abuse, exploitation, but also the support services that protect them. And the data that came in from the child helplines globally has shown an increase in violence that children are experiencing in their home, confined with parents, under stress, who have lost jobs. But the data has also showed us that the mental health of children and their caregivers was one of the top concerns. And I wanna thank the ambassador specifically for her advocacy on that point. Now with access to children, such a challenge during the pandemic, social services, case management, helplines, messaging, all adapted to the situation. And I think Maya and others also spoke about that as well, finding creative ways to reach children and to protect them. We also seized on opportunities in the crisis. And I think this is important learning for the future as well. Um, for example, child protection actors engage with authorities to release children from detention and safely reintegrate them into family care, an area where it was so difficult to get traction. So there's something about these opportunities that come up in crisis as well, while at the same time we try and push back on any um, rolling back of child rights. One of the key issues that's come out in our learning and was highlighted during this discussion today is the importance of a multi-sectoral approach. You talked about a holistic approach as well. And I think COVID-19 has made the interconnected nature of children's protection abundantly clear. Health, education, social protection, food security, all of them are key to child protection. And the child protection area of responsibility is well-placed to lead efforts on the centrality of protection because of this interconnectedness. We've um, invested in initiatives, a framework agreement with the education cluster, working with food security cluster as well, to have a more nuanced analysis, as some of the speakers said earlier, to look at the ways that food security is having impact, impact on child protection. These are excellent examples of this type of leadership. Tasha, so, I need to move you along a bit. Forgive me for interrupting. My you. last point then is that to this um, top six minimum standards are central to this multi-sectoral approach. Those are standards, it's about obligation. We don't have enough funding to meet those standards. And this is where the still unprotected report that we commissioned through the CPAOR and the Alliance meets the findings of the NRC funding study. And I really want to appreciate them for that. It is acutely underfunded. In order to be able to do both the um, integrated approach and also specialized services, we need to increase funding proportional to all of the other sectors. Thank you so much, Chris. 
Thank you so much indeed, Tasha. Good to have you with us. I'm still unprotected, by the way, referenced in the NRC Global Protection Report too. So thanks for that reminder. I'd like to move to Bruno Donat, Global Coordinator, Mine Action Area of Responsibility of the Global Protection Cluster and Chief United Nations Mine Action Service in Geneva. Bruno, we heard earlier of the double whammy. Cecilia mentioned dealing with climate migrants in times of COVID. You're dealing with mines in times of COVID. How on earth do you do that? Thank you for your question. Um, so mine action, just for most of those who are not into this area, is everything that is an explosive hazard, okay, everything that goes boom. The layer of the pandemic, as mentioned by others, added to the pressure. So what we did, definitely localized operations. We did two things. You know, I, I, I just moved from an Ebola affected area, but now I'm in Geneva. So we kind of knew how to react to something where you need to do more safety. Because I heard some, somebody said fluffy in protection. There's ain't nothing fluffy about saving lives of children and the hazard. So for us, we did two things. Momentarily, we've had to pause some activities like clearance because people could not move around. However, we increased risk education. Direct local, local operations, we translated with the help of WHO, whom we thank, taking the key messages of, of how to protect yourself in the risk education. One more point, if, if I may, if you give me 10 more seconds, I want to say, you know, in protection, in something like mine action, there's also the sequence, because you cannot, you have to protect people first to be able to do those other things people talked about, whether it is peace and development, because if you do not protect children, women in some areas, you cannot move forward. And right. And, and, and if I want to be against the current, I want to say sometimes to the converted donors, we don't have to go outside of the box. Come back in the box sometimes, earmark some funding, prioritize, because many people go to try to do humanitarian operations without the safety that is needed not only for the affected populations, but other humanitarian operations. Thank Bruno. you for your question. Excellent report. I love this report. Oh, thank you. It, it, your, your, your 10 seconds were long, but they're now over. Thank you so much, Bruno. That's great. Um, we need to come, I think, to William. William, there's been a lot. Um, I think Manuel will probably regret having used that word cuddly, not cuddly, fluffy, I think it was. Um, but it was meant in the best possible spirit. But William, um, if you're there, can you um, come in? You've as you said, you've had this four month of Zoom conversations. We are on the eve of the global humanitarian overview. What have you picked up? A few points that you've picked up from this panel that you'd like to emphasize in conclusion. Thanks very much. Uh, this has been, I think, a fantastic end uh, for the forum. The first message is let's close today and focus on tomorrow. For all the donors and the agencies that are going to the GHO launch, read it, read its requirements in light of what you heard today and prioritize right and prioritize smart. My second message is to, to all the field colleagues that are today with us, to all the coordinators of the areas of responsibilities and specialization. You have gone through a long year I want to thank you for everything visible that you have done. I also even more want to thank you for all the discrete moments where you have reached a success that you cannot put in a report or where you have really tried to, to do something good and it didn't work because of several reasons. For these moments, I really want to thank you and let you know that we know and we're behind you for this. We've heard today a lot. I welcome, and that's my third point, member states jumping on commitments from the US and Switzerland for the mid-year review, protection outcomes from Switzerland, Norway on the Security Council, Australia on localization, and the Netherlands on MHPHS. We will follow up with you. This is great uh, uh, immediate outcome of this event. Finally, my last sentence goes to the local actors that are here with us today on the call. 
if there is one measure of the success of protection coordination, which we lead uh, in the protection cluster, is that we need to pro transform protection coordination to fit the majority of its membership, you national protection actors. So I uh, want to finish by saying, this is what we really want to focus on in the next year. We've committed in the report for multiple uh, uh, areas where we want to push forward. We have seen today strong alliance and friendship and people jumping uh, to join us for a quantum leap that we are willing and committed to take forward. So onwards and upwards and many thanks to all of you. Thank you so much, William. That's a, a wonderful way to conclude. I'd like, though, to give the final word to Jan Eglund. Jan, I'm being told um, by NRC and, and, and Global Protection Cluster people to, to get a move on. So I give you the floor for a few minutes. Jan, thank you so much. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> camera uh, popping uh, over. It's been a very good event. And thanks to you, uh, Chris, for being dynamic here. Um, listen, to we're here as humanitarian actors on the ground. We're here also as member states. We need to make a deal. One is that uh, the donors need to fund protection better. We need more donors and they need to be more generous. We cannot have so many unfunded projects and unfunded organizations. The second one is that we as humanitarian actors on the ground and we're, we're local, we're, we're national, we're international, we need to be even better in em emphasizing that there has to be local action, there has to be local protection action so that this suffering alone doesn't continue. Now, um, it will vary a lot from, uh, is, is it peace? Is it war? Uh, are, are we targeted or are we not? Uh, in, in, in the, the mask is outside Bono. It, let's not be naive. It's, it's, it's not going to be a little bit more money for, for, for local or international groups to stay and deliver among the people who are being massacred. It's going to be difficult. We, we, we have to be much more targeted on how to document the abuse, how to make those responsible for the abuse accountable, end impunity, uh, be tougher with also humanitarian diplomacy from member states, with those who can influence those who commit uh, the abuse. Um, and then Let's perhaps have fewer seminars in Geneva and New York and Oslo and all of these places where we talk about it. Uh, we have we have to focus on local action. Um, we you could call it the Kivu test. Uh, the abuse of women in Kivu has now been something we've been discussing for twenty years. Um, and let's not have more seminars and reports and panels discussing it. We need to be there in the villages. So uh, action should pass the key vote test. It should make the, the, the people uh, protected and we should be better to communicate with them. They need to advise us. So thanks a lot, uh, everybody. Uh, it's been a great honor for NRC and the protection cluster to, to, to initiate this. Thanks to uh, Switzerland and all of the countries who have helped us on the way.